Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest on the line right now. Uh, the right. founder of BET, Bob Johnson. Yeah. Welcome. Hey, thanks, man. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Welcome to all y'all, too. I hope everybody's safe. Not just the founder of BET, uh, America's first black billionaire, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You work hard enough, they pay you stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, you, you just made some noise because you released a statement calling for the federal government to pay $14 trillion in reparations to the descendants of slaves. I, I know why that's necessary, but tell the people why that's necessary. Well, it's necessary for two reasons. Uh, the first and foremost is when you are damaged by a society for which you have no control of, over and which uh, has denied you the fundamental human rights, economic rights, social rights that they pro propose to deliver to everybody, you ask yourself the question, why have I not received those rights over the 200 plus years of this nation? So it's an atonement component to it, basically making you whole for what they promised you but was never delivered. The second part of it is that African Americans transferred a huge amount of wealth to white Americans, which Charlemagne explains why white Americans have 10 times the net worth in terms of median income of black Americans. It's because they were, we were denied the wealth that we were promised you know, when they said a nation of people created as equals, we were denied that. We work for free as slaves. They use our free labor to make investments and grow businesses. We fought in the wars seeking opportunity equal to what they had. We come back home from the wars of World War II and Vietnam. We're denied housing, which is the primary factor of economic wealth for all middle income families. Education, we had to go to the court in Brown versus Board of Education to get education equal. They declared separate and, une separate and unequal is inherently unequal. And we're denied access to income, wealth. And as a result of that, there's a huge wealth gap that unless it is solved by reparation, which is consistent with what the world has done for me, um, Jews were given reparation by the descendants of people who, run, who ran Nazi Germany. And, and the word I hear from people is saying, I've never uh, had a slave, I've never done to a slave. Well, every German citizen who was not even born when Hitler killed millions of Jews could say the same thing, but they didn't. They recognized the need for atonement and apology. And fi finally, if white Americans could embrace apology the way black Americans embrace forgiveness, this country would be far better off. And you, all of you here listening, remember Charlottesville. White man goes into a church, murders eight or nine African-American church members. The first thing the church members do when they go in for the sentencing hearing as victims or friends of the victim, they, at, they tell the perpetrator, the murderer, we forgive you. Mm -hmm. Also, you all remember this thing when the white police officer walked in the wrong house, killed a black man thinking he's in her house, the mm -hmm. first thing his brother does is ask the judge if he could go over and hug the killer of his brother. So we are forgiving people. White America should match us in forgiveness and match us in reimbursement for damages that they caused to us for which we had no part in for over 200 years. It's as simple as that. We have the money to do it because already we're doing it. White Americans, if you go to a group of white Americans today and say, 
Should we help you with food stamps? Check your box, of course we'll help you. Will we help you with Section 8 low-income housing? Yes, we'll do that. We will check you with welfare program. Of course we'll do that. But when you ask them to give you cash to make you equal in a capitalist society, which is the defining factor of wealth and equality in a capitalist society is access to wealth, they will say there's something wrong with giving you money because that was 200 years ago. Uh, uh, Vice President Biden said, and I quote, I'll be damned if I will give anyone any money for something I didn't cause. Now, that's the mentality. Yet at the same time, the Germans stood up, millions of dollars still going to Jews for the Holocaust. So it's time for African Americans to understand you are owed that as much as the Jews were owed that. And so when white Americans or even some black Americans say you're overreaching, how do we overreach when we are entitled to damages to make us whole? It's, it's, there's no way you can make that argument. And fundamentally, white America is already doing it in terms of transfer payments that they're giving to African Americans. All we're saying is don't give us program, don't give us welfare, don't give us food stamp, give us the money we will invest it, manage it, and grow our people and our communities ourselves. How do you think the money should come? Do you think it should be each individual family? Do you think it should be somebody who invests the money for us? If you had a choice, how would that money come to the people? Well, well it's a good question. Here's the thing. I fundamentally believe that every African American who's a descendant of slaves regardless of their income, regardless of uh, their position, is entitled to reparations. Because reparations carry atonement. It carries an apology, which is one of the things that's missing in this day. Collect it from taxpayers. And we've done that. We take taxpayer money to pay food stamps. We take taxpayers' money to pay welfare. We take taxpayers' money to do to give low income housing. So we do it. We even take taxpayers' money to send it around the world to other countries who want to we who we want to be like us. We have something called USAID. It's an agency of the United States government. They go around and look at countries where they can use this money to foster rule of law, foster democracy, foster better conditions so there's no revolution in those countries. But when we ask them to do it here, they find it impossible to come to grips with the fact that African Americans are due and entitled to reparations. I'll tell you something that you may, not, may or may not know. After World War II, French American Jews, who American Jews who were French were living in the United States, filed a lawsuit against the French railroad company that transported French Jews to extermination camps in Germany. The American government, not wanting to have a, a dispute with one of their, our World War II allies and a long-term ally for us going forward against Russian communism, they cut a deal. Here's what the deal said. The French said, pass a law that says the American Jews can't sue you, can't sue the train, and in return, we, the French, will give $60 million to the American Jews. If that's not reparations, based on what America thinks is in their best interest, I don't know what is. So I'm saying, if it's in your best interest to have French Jews walk away from a lawsuit against the trains, why is it not in your best interest to say to Black Americans, why not give you what you are due? Every dollar of your labor, unpaid for, went into building this country. Every white American can trace some connection to slavery for their wealth disparity. And the wealth disparity shows like this. The median African-American family has a net worth of $17,000. That means half have more, half have less. 
the median net worth of a white American family is $170,000. Now, how did they get that much money more than we did? It's only one week, unless you assume that we don't like to work, we do. Let's just assume we have no commitment to protect and help our families achieve wealth, we do. Unless you assume that that we have some DNA in us that make us not able to manage money. Not true. I'm pretty much proof of that. Mm -hmm. So the point, the point is, the only reason is we were held back while they were running forward. So just take this simple analogy. If you're running ahead of me, you're 10 yards ahead of me, running at five miles an hour. I'm 10 yards behind you running at five miles an hour. You know, I will never catch up with you. Right. It's just simple fact. So that's, that's my point about why reparations and the way we arrived at the 14 trillion, simply this. This is how much net worth and wealth white Americans have. This is what black Americans have. Bring us up to your level in wealth. And that will cost you, depending on whether you do it over 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, a dollar, a certain amount of dollar amount. But don't give it to me in program. Don't give it to me in house, sexual aid housing. Don't give it to me in food stamps. You know, quote Cuba Gooding, show me the money. And with the money, I can prove to you that I can manage well. I can build economic equality for myself and my family. I have the same motivation you do. And that is all we're asking you to do. And you've done it. You do it around the world in your foreign policy. You spend X number of million dollars in programs uh, already for us. Just move the money from A to B. That's all we're asking. We're not asking you to do any more than what you're already doing in many aspects. Let me ask you a question, OG Bob. Um, do, you, do, you, do you think money could change a system, though? Because we're trying to dismantle this system of white supremacy, and I want reparations for slavery as well, but would it be better served going towards, like, education, health care, housing, or loans and grants for small businesses, or should everyone just get a lump sum of money? Hey, hey guy, let me ask you a question. If you had all the money that, that you want, would you be concerned about educating your kids? If you had no, all the cool. money that you want, would, oh, would you be worried about your son doing like Michael Brown, walking into a store in Ferguson and stealing some cigarillos? Would you be concerned about your brother or your son in New York City, like Eric Gardner, selling looses? No, because you would know you have the confidence of access to wealth, control of wealth. That's the difference. This is a capitalistic society. You gotta start there. This is the capitalistic society. What is the fundamental measure of wealth and power? It's access to capital. So mm -hmm. if African Americans don't have capital, if they can't look at the morning and see their wife and their wife say, what are we going to do about our kid while we don't have can can't afford a babysitter? They get frustrated. You get problems in families. When people can't invest in their own neighborhoods to build stores and restaurants and shops, what happens? They get frustrated. These riots or protests or violence you see, they don't happen to people who have wealth. The, the society here is a country of wealth and order and protection and preservation of property. Think about this. Do you know Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, and George Floyd died over a dispute of approximately $40? Think about this. I don't know how much cigarillos cost. Mm -hmm. They don't cost a lot. I have no idea how much Lucy's cost on the streets of New York. It don't cost a lot. I know George Floyd was allegedly have taken a, uh, a $20 check and a $20 bill. Yeah. So, so what we got? We got $40 of dispute that led to three black men's death. 
Take those black men, put them in another situation. Great jobs, great economic opportunities, savings in the stock market, you know, opportunity for themselves and family. First of all, why, why steal cigarillos when you got in your pocket $200? Why sell looses when you got in your pocket $500? Why allegedly deliver a counterfeit check or a, or a $20 bill when you got $400 in your pocket? That's what wealth does. It gives you confidence. It gives you belief and hope. It gives you the ability to know that you can take care of your family and your kids. That's what white America but it does. It, and but, that's but what it, they but define. It, but, it doesn't, but it doesn't make a racist not racist, though. Like a racist, a, well, you, know, you are a white man. A white man will still look at you and be like, "I don't like that nigga." Now that's a that's a whole other problem. But that doesn't mean you don't get the money. You're gonna if you're gonna deal with that problem. Malcolm X said it very clearly. He said, "What do you call a black man with a million dollars? A nigga." Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you, you can take you can take one step at a time, but two step at a time. Martin Luther King said it even different. He said, "You can't legislate morality." but you can regulate behavior. So mm -hmm. my point is you got to start someplace. And I start with what white America values more than anything else. And mm -hmm. that's access and control of wealth. So True. if I want to start being equal to somebody, I'm going to go to the thing they value most because that's how they define themselves as superior. I have more wealth than you. I have more access to wealth than you. That's the way they define themselves as a superior nation. People talk about American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is based on two things. One, the belief that we are a superior moral nation. We will do things. We will go to war to stop the Nazis. We will go to war to stop the communists in Vietnam. We will give money to countries to promote democracy and rule of law. That's sort of, and supposedly, we will care for people in America to make them equal in opportunity and rights. But so why that's don't we hold that money? Why don't we hold that money? You talk like, so is it, is it best to, as a, as a community, and say, you know what, since money is the power, we say, you know what, we're going to hold our money and not spend it with these corporations and hurt them that way and say that we're really not playing on top of the protest and on top of everything else that we're doing. Because if, if the black community spends billions of dollars a year on goods that's not going back in our community, you say, you know what, we're going to stop. Will that hurt them in the pocket? Will that make them, you know, open an eye? The way the... Uh... The way you look at uh, economic wealth is you have to control it. And you're absolutely right. But the answer to that question is this. And it, I, I often quote this song, my favorite song about how we deal with the situation we're in. It's a Bob Marley tune called Redemption Song. Mm -hmm. The line that I always quote in Redemption Song is this. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Only ourselves can change our mind. Black Americans have to emancipate themselves from mental slavery that we cannot do for ourselves. And once we start doing that, your answer is right. <clears throat> because if reparations were issued today, and over 30 mm -hmm. years you gave black people uh, $14 trillion, most of that money, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, will go right back into the white consumer community. They, they spend it all there. And so to me, that's what another thing I say, white people, why are you worried? You're going to get the money back anyway. But to your point, <coughs> get a black Americans to build their own society, it's a mental thing. We've got, I mean, we've got to do things. For example, we have no causes today. There's only, there's only two causes, one cause that I can really say that particular millennials and, and younger black folks embrace, and that is Black Lives Matter, because it comes down to the heart of their existence. It's almost what they right. call ex existential existence. You don't embrace that, you can get, you can be like George Floyd, you can get murdered. So here, here's my thing. We have to begin to change our mental attitude towards who we are. For example, 
and, and God, you know this, we 90% vote in the Democratic Party, almost lockstep. Right. And you ask people, well, why you do it? And you know, why are you voting this way against Trump? Why are you voting against uh, you? Why are you in favor of Biden? Well, I don't really like Biden. Some people say, I like Bernie. I like this one. I like, you know. But they say, it's the lesser of two evils. Now, when you get in a position where you are taking the lesser of two evils, by sheer definition, you are taking the lesser. Mm. Why do we have to take the lesser? Why don't we take the better? And to me, the better could be come up with a cause that says Black Lives Matter is our cause, reparations is our cause, and going back to a, what the Congressional Black Caucus was founded with about the oh, old 16 or 20 members in 1972. This is what their philosophy was. Black Americans should have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, permanent enemies. just permanent interests. Interest. We should form our own, what I call PIP, Permanent Interest Party. Say to the Democrats, you want our vote? VP Biden to be the president now, here's what we want. We want reparations. We want fundamental implementation of all the policies of Black Lives Matter. What, what are they gonna say? Well, we're not gonna do it. If Biden had said that down in South Carolina, he wouldn't be nowhere near being the president. That's what we have to do. We have to take control of our destiny. No minority group in a society has ever taken control of his destiny by becoming a permanent appendage of a dominant society. You can go back in history and read all about it. Any minority group in a two-party system particularly, if they say we're going to ignore the, the other party and only give our support to the other party, you're going to become, back to where we were in slavery, a chattel piece of property of the dominant party. And that's why BP Biden had enough nerve, if you call it, to say and on your show, you ain't black unless you vote for me. How could you ever conceive of somebody saying to somebody white, you ain't white unless you vote for me. That would never enter their brain. But they'll do it with us because we have become chattel to them. They feel they are masters. And that's what we do. We've done it since the John F. Kennedy days and everything else. We just said, we're going to put our, cast our lot here. We ain't going to do permanent interest. We're going to do permanent friends. And what do you think would happen friends, if, if PIP approached Donald Trump with these same uh, demands? Well, you know what you'd have to do with those same demands? To get power, and control power, the first thing you got to do is show power. So if you want to make somebody else concerned about your ability as to be the balance of power between Republicans and Democrats, you know what you do? What you do is this. You simply say, guys, let's demonstrate our power. Let's vote PIP, B, Black Black BLM. Let's put in that line where it say President BLM, PIP, whatever you want to put in that line. And all of a sudden, all of those black votes in key states, you know, so-called toss-up states, and banks basically that's what happened with, with, with Hillary. Black folks said, I ain't motivated enough, I ain't gonna show up. Trump won. Show white America that if we move left this way because they're in our permanent interest, or we move right this way because they're in our permanent interest, we become the power brokers in America. We're 40 million strong, growing faster, we and the Hispanics, growing faster than the white population. So I don't, I don't care how you feel or not, 10, 15 years from now, the majority of Americans based on demographic growth will be minorities. 
So if we don't take the mantle and become the dominant influential minority in a power broker, power balance sense, I can assure you the Hispanic vote will be. They will vote as a block. They don't vote as a block the way we do. So I would say that to uh, President Trump, President Trump, you want to contest for our votes? Here's our demands. Stand up to them and we can talk. Go to the Democrats. Hear our demands. Stand up to them. We can talk. Even just recently, I read where uh, President Obama said young people should challenge the political authority. And the political authority to me has challenged the black leadership that is somewhat old, somewhat moribund in their ability to confront the Democratic Party. I can tell you this, I worked on Capitol Hill as a press secretary, and I know this. There's some 63, 60 plus members of the Black Caucus. The Black Caucus, if they wanted to, could control Nancy Pelosi. All they gotta say is, you will never pass a bill as a Democratic Party without our approval. Because they got 60 mm -hmm. votes. And the Republicans are against them with all their votes. The thing about it, I think, I want everybody to understand who's listening to you, uh, is this. We have come at a time, a period in history, where we have more power than we ever had because this country is a two-party system. They can't win without us. But if we keep giving all of our votes to one party, we are diluting our political power. Why would anybody do that? And all I'm saying is that's a simple fact, and they know it. And I tell you, when I was running BET, and I'd ask the Democratic Party to put some money behind in BET to uh, turn out the black vote, here's what I'd get from the <clears throat> campaign advisors. They'd say, Bob, look, we got your vote. You don't have to worry about your vote. We need to be in these districts where the white vote can move one way or the other. In other words, take us for granted. Mm -hmm. You ain't black unless you vote for me. Take us for granted. All of this, we're going to put y'all in chains, speaking to us like that, like we ain't real people. All of this, no, we ain't going to give you any cash money, but we'll give you programs. I don't understand why we let that happen when we just, in the past two elections, well, leading up to this one, we put a black man in the White House, power. We now put a white man in the nomination to be in power. And for some reason, you don't recognize the power equation that you have. And you just sit there and say, if they want to go this way, that's the way we don't go. It's, it's, you skip, you it's skip, one, skip one important one. You skip 2016. In 2016, 4.4 million voters who voted in 2012 stayed home in 2016, and a third of them were black. And in the midterms, black women, uh, I, I think, accounted for like more than 55% of, of the votes in some places. Yeah, you're, you're right. The only reason, the only reason Hillary got more black women votes was because of black, the more women vote was because of black women. White women said, mm -hmm. white women exercise what I call PIP, permanent interest party. They say, look, we going with this guy named Trump who we think can help us better than Hillary could. They exercised it and did it. But what did we do? We didn't. And as a result of that, here's what happened is, if we channeled that, I mean, it's, 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 it's not, it, the thing about this, reparations, nor voting in our own interests are not difficult things. It's a mental problem. We got to accept the fact that we have power. You know, to me, when people talk about white supremacy, you know why white supremacy is the dominant force? Because you have to have a group that allows them to dominate you. You can't be a, uh, you can't be a white supremacist or, or white racist without somebody out of fear or either by being co-opted are willing to let you dominate them. That is it. You, uh, if you look at any history, 
those people who were controlled by a dominant group were either coerced physically in terms of threat, fear of annihilation of some court, i.e. what happened to the Jews, or they allowed themselves to be co-opted and said, don't worry, we're going to take care of you, just be quiet. Accept the fact that you are inferior without our superiority protection. And you know, I, I was a history major throughout my whole life at the University of Illinois and Princeton University. And I know for a fact that Black Americans at this time really had no cause. We had a cause in the civil rights. We had a cause, even during the war in poverty, we thought we were gonna get better. We believed it. But now our cause has reverted to and I believe Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, for me, is far beyond just keeping us from being killed by the police. It's that we have standing in society and give us our due for having stand inside. You ask us to go to war for you. We go to war in Europe and you make us truck drivers. We can't be in the combat arms because you don't believe we're equal to you to fight. But we're over there while we're being murdered and lynched back home. But we're over there fighting for something you said we should believe in. We go to Vietnam to fight people, as Muhammad Ali said, no Viet Cong ever called me a nigga. But we go and we die and now we're on the wall in DC. But yet, George Floyd is dead. Eric Gardner is dead. Breon is, uh, is dead. But every time you call upon us to be a good citizen, to believe what Martin Luther King said, you know, I hope one day black boys and little black and little white girls and little black boys will play together and we want to judge you on the content of your character. Well, when we say trust our character that if you give us money, we aren't stupid. We ain't gonna go out and spend it at the club. We ain't gonna go out and spend it at the liquor store. We gonna take care of our family. And you say, no, 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 we really don't believe that. Oh, by the way, I wasn't born when your folks were slaves. I wasn't born, I didn't have a slave. Well, yes, you did, you had a slave. Can I tell you what that slave was? The people who made the money off of slavery became the future bankers the future railroad owners, the future TV media owners, because they got that wealth of land and property transferred to them over time. We didn't have that. So that's why some of these universities are saying they got to make reparations to black students at university because their founders financed the slave ships that carried black people on the middle passage, left them dying in the water because they were sick and couldn't make any money when they landed. All of that was what America created. The revered Thomas Jefferson never sold his slaves. All of that is America. Native American Indians were wiped out under manifest destiny because we own that land. They killed the Indians, they killed the buffalo, and they put them on reservation without the, without the buffalo, without their national inheritance. And they said, guess what we're going to do for you? We got something for you. We're going to give you casinos. So you can be happy that you got a, a gambling casino now. That is America's legacy. And so what to me is atonement, atonement, forget the cash for the moment, atonement is to look the people you deprived of rights, even though you said you were founded on rights. No nation so dedicated to this, this, this thing of equal rights and equal opportunity can long endure, as Abraham Lincoln paraphrasing it at the Gettysburg Address. Here's the thing, America, what is your fear of looking black people in the eye and saying, 
my brother, you've done everything we asked for you to do. You've gone to war for us. You tried your best to raise your family. We want to give you over 30 years, $11,000 a year to atone and apologize. You know what black people would do? They would call a hallelujah course to say, we forgive white America. The great, great President Mandela, the first thing he did when he was out of prison at Robben Island to his inauguration, one of the first people he invited to be at his inauguration was the jailer who controlled him on Robben's Island. That is the forgiveness of people of color. But you ask white America, you ask Mitch McConnell, oh, I don't know how to do this. I can't figure out this. I didn't do the thing. You ask Joe Biden, I'll be damned if I'm going to give anything. And you ask some of these black folks, oh, I'm scared to talk about reparations because the white folks get upset and they'll vote against us and then we lose the election. I'm saying, young black folk, old black folks, you will always be economically unequal in this society unless you attain wealth compatible, equal to the majority of white Americans. So if that's your destiny, if you want to take that as your destiny, just raise your hand and say, I have no problems as long, uh, with white people being 10 times more wealthy than I am. Then, you know, you go back and do what you do. <laughs> but that's your fate. I mean, it's nothing, there is nothing the final thing I will say this, I, I, when I used to talk about this, the Pew Research Firm, which is a big firm that, that does a lot of research on social, economic, and, and political issues. They stated this, and this is something I think every black person, every white person should, should, should understand. Mm -hmm. They said this, black Americans, the children of black Americans, whose families were solidly, solidly middle class in the 60s and 70s, will never attain the wealth of their parents. Now, think about that. If you will never attain the wealth of your parents, and your parents are already 10 times behind white American families and parents, tell me where you will be in 20 years. Mm. And all we get from everybody, from business leaders and politicians is we got to bring you to this country. We got to focus on this. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to the people in Minneapolis say, we're going to have a civil rights investigation of the police force in Minneapolis over the past 10 years. Now I ask all of you guys sitting here, who over the past 10 years have been running the police force in Minneapolis? The same white people who now want to investigate. White people. The police, the police in many cases are tools for, scape, for scapegoating of the white leadership class that control the police. They say to you, it's your problem. Well, you hired me. You set the training policies. You tell me how much I got paid. You gave me my assignments. And now you're saying, I did something wrong. I was working for you. How do I, how do I do that? How do I have the blame now? But that's their scapegoat. And it's a problem to us. Oh, we're going to have a civil rights investigation of the people we've been running for 10 years. And you say, whoa, whoa, why don't you have a civil rights investigation of you? You've been running them for the past 10 years. And so you understand how the police frustrated. They get it from both ends. I wouldn't even be a policeman today for anything in the world because they, it's a, it's a no-win situation. You tell me what to do. You tell me to arrest somebody for Lucy cigarettes? And then when something happens, you, you blame me? You well, tell no, me the to come back. The police, the police, the police, the police go overboard with the chokehold and the brutality. So they bring a lot of that on themselves. Like I don't, like a lot of the policemen go into a situation scared, pull out guns when they don't have to, use force. Overly aggressive. Yeah, I, I understand that, but 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 ask yourself this: Who hired the police? What do you expect police to come into a job 
guy, 19, 18, didn't graduate from college. I mean, you know, high school guy. He's supposed to come in and say, oh, my job is to discern the issues that affect my relationship to me. These guys ain't, these guys aren't trained. They hey, but your boost. father was they a police a officer. He does. wasn't. Hmm? You would say you, your father was a police officer. He could discern yes, he what was right yeah, in the community you, and what was wrong. And you know, and you, and you know why? Your father, the police officer, has an identity with the people you police. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, if you Thank bring you. all the people who have an identity with police, because you know, go back, take Michael Ferguson. Michael mm -hmm. Ferguson walking down the street. Black police officer, he probably knows him. Maybe he knows his mother's sister. Michael Brown. Maybe going out with his- Michael Brown, Michael, Michael Brown. Brown. In Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael Brown and Ferguson. Maybe he's going down there. Now he really know Mike. He may know Michael. Oh, he may know Michael's brother. He ain't going out with Michael's uh, sister. He wants to say, his first thing is, Michael, what are you doing? He doesn't see confrontation because he's part of Michael's legacy, part of Michael's community. So I when it. I say the police, police, police do not just pop out of the earth. Police are hired, trained, paid for by a capitalistic system to say your job is to protect property rights of the society. That mm -hmm. is what they do. So yeah, you can you can blame individual police and everybody's responsible for themselves. But I'm talking about in a systemic way, overall, you tell me that's that's like saying, you know, we got people who are bad in and of themselves. We got once they put that uniform on, something changes in their natural. No. That uniform is somebody saying, you put this uniform on. Here are your requirements to wear that uniform. And I feel, imagine, I feel sorry for some of them because they don't know what to do. All they know is this. Our job is when I'm walking down the street and I see somebody who look like they're black or are black in a neighborhood, my immediate instinct is they shouldn't be here. I mean, I, I can tell you personally, and every black person you talk to, can tell you personally situations where a black man is someplace where either white people say they're in that position because they're black or they're in this position and they're black and they shouldn't be there. I can tell you right now, I have been in some of the best restaurants in LA, best restaurants in DC, and I'm out there waiting on my car, beautiful, Jaguar, Ferrari, whatever I had at the time. Okay. White couple no, get out of the, white couple get out of their car. I'm sitting there waiting on my car. They come up to me and they hand me their key. They think you're the valet. Do they get a valet? Absolutely. You got it. Because in their mind, that's where I be. That's what I mean. I a, that is what is the situation in a mindset that exists. And when you hire those we gotta people, we got we got to change the mindset. We got to change the mindset all across the board. Because even with what you just said, yeah. even if you got the wealth, people still view you a certain way because of your skin color. Absolutely. Ma Ma Malcolm X said it better than I could. You know what do you call a black man with a million dollars? That's <laughs> what it is. I mean, I tell you, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna tell you one more anecdote. I'm gonna let you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, my daughter is an equestrian. She rides horses, and so it's very expensive to be an equestrian. So I had a, you know, a farm in Virginia. And one day I decided I would go down and ride horses. That is a 200 plus acre farm you know, with horses. I walk in and there's this white guy who is there to do something to the uh, plumbing system. I walk in, it's a true story. The white guy who's the plumber looks at me walk in and says, hey, now I own the farm, 200 right. acre farm, heart of, the, heart of Rolling Hills, Virginia and everything else. I own the farm. He looks at me and said, hey, if you hear the mop, you better hurry up because I'm getting ready to shut off the water to fix the plumbing. Damn. In other words, in other words, this guy's mindset, his computer mind would not let him ever conceive that a black man owned a farm 
in Middleburg, Virginia. It just was out of his scope of understanding. And so all of a sudden he says to me, you know, you better hurry up and mop because I got to do this. Now, I'm not saying he's a blatant racist, but his mind would not allow him to see black wealth that would allow this to happen. So what I did, I said, nah, I don't think I'm gonna mop today. I think I'm gonna go get on the horses. So all of a sudden he looked at me and said, oh my God, this nigga's gonna ride the boss's horses. So I'm looking at this and said, and the horses looked at him and said, oh, you're talking to the boss. So the point I'm trying to make is this, guys, look, <laughs> you are not going to change racism at all. But that does not have anything to do with you not getting paid for past Word. damages to your people. That's the thing I mean. And the only way we, you're going to do it. We can build our own system. We can build our own system with the money. Once you got the money, yeah. Once you got the money, it's, a, it's up to you. Now, if we end up giving it all back to them, that's, that's on us. But give us what we are due. That's fundamentally Absolutely. the only thing I can say. Well, I thank you so America, much for calling, man. Yes. We appreciate you, brother. Yes, America has to atone for its sins of the past, especially slavery. And Bob, um, don't forget to leave that um, house, house in Anguilla for me and your will, okay? <laughs> that house you got, you got in Anguilla, leave that for me. Why are you uh, killing him off it. already? Yeah, wait, why are you let him yeah. go like that? You I didn't say that. Like that. No, no, God, God. <laughs> when you get reparations, you go buy your own house. There you go. Hey, there, you go. there you keep, go. Keep keep fighting, Charlemagne. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Goodness gracious, y'all. <laughs> All Thank right, you I'm so gonna, much. I'm, I'm hoping to see you Sunday, though. Yeah, Sunday. We're going to do the virtual town hall on Sunday with um, uh, OG Bob Johnson and a few other uh, great black voices. So, yeah, we're going to do it that Sunday. All Thank right. you. Now, are, we, are, are we doing this in uh, Ann Willow? Just asking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, brother. Take Appreciate you for checking in.